and of course. So it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody to London Vegans meeting and to Dr. Mahesh Shah, who was our guest speaker for this evening. Uh, Mahesh is a, a GP, a doctor in Harrow in Northwest London, and is also trained as a nutritional therapist with the, so it's the College of Naturopathic Medicine. And today's talk, uh, by the way, also his website, which is the thegreendoctor.uk. I'm sure he's going to tell us more um, about himself, but the specific talk is going to focus a little bit on the gut microbiome. So without further ado, may I hand over to Mahesh. Thank you very much, Brian. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, wonderful to be here with uh, everybody else who's, uh, who's joining this evening. Um, what I'll do is I'll just start off by sharing my screen. I hope you can see this now. Yes. Perfect. Great. Okay. So, yeah, it's uh, wonderful to uh, wonderful to um, be here today. Um, thanks for the introduction, Brian. Um, just uh, just a bit about me. Um, I'm Mahesh, uh, fondly known fondly known as Mesh. Um, I've been vegan about five years now, uh, and I'm a GP, uh, having qualified from the Hull York Medical School in 2010. Um, and as you mentioned, Brian, uh, I'm a nutritional therapist, having qualified from the College of Naturopathic Medicine. Uh, and I uh, provide nutritional therapy uh, services and consultations uh, via my uh, company called The Green Doctor. Uh, and I'm also UK director for uh, an organization called WFPB.org. Uh, and I'll have a little bit more information about the, the latter two uh, towards the end of the presentation. So just as you have to do, uh, I've got a little disclaimer uh, here uh, as well, just about the information that, that will be shared. So just to take that on board. So let's get started. I, I know you must be maybe intrigued by the title <laughs> of the of the presentation so let's get let's get started so the amazon rainforest lush vegetation towering trees the amazon river big cats the colorful birds the tree dwelling animals and the ones that make us jump all these life forms living together in a biodiverse environment thriving in a stable ecosystem. Enter humanity. The demands of industrialization and animal agriculture is leading to the decimation of large swathes of the rainforest, bringing destruction to the local Amazonian life and habitat, but also impacting the planet as a whole, contributing to global warming and ensuing natural disasters, which we're seeing all too often around us now. Just like the Amazon rainforest of Earth, we have our very own Amazon. Living in and on us, we are teeming with trillions of micro beings. Microorganisms such as bacteria, viruses, and fungi, with whom we have co-evolved uh, a symbiotic relationship over millions of years, whereby they can benefit from us and we can benefit from them. Together with their genetic material, they form the human microbiome. Research suggests that bacteria in our microbiome number 39 trillion, as opposed to just 30 trillion human cells. And the number of genes of the gut microbiome, that is the part of the other microbiome that's specific to the gut, outnumber human genes by a whopping 150 fold. So really, we're more bacterial than bug than human. And indeed, increasing research into the gut microbiome is changing and inspiring a new way of approaching <laughs> It's interesting to see how we seem to be coming full circle back to the wisdom of our ancients when 2,500 years ago, Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut. So let's step into the gut microbiome forest. So our gut starts at the mouth and ends at the anus. And in an adult, can be as long as 30 feet when stretched out. From one end to the other live trillions yeah. of microorganisms. And so far, we know mostly about the bacteria. And just for information, the scientific term for when we refer to the bugs in the gut is gut microbiota. 
as opposed to the gut microbiome, which refers to the gut bugs and their genetic material collectively. As we go down the gut, the number and species of bacteria generally tend to increase. With the large bowel that I'm pointing out right now with the cursor being a reservoir for most diversity. Once thought to just be there due to the environments of the gut, we are now beginning to understand that the microbes have a fundamentally vital role to play in our health. Healthy levels of beneficial bacteria seem to be essential for many activities in the body, including digestion and absorption, detoxification, for example, aiding with getting rid of cholesterol and heavy metals from the body, immune function, heart health, yeah. hormone balance, yeah. and mental well-being. And in addition to the vitamins we consume through food, beneficial bacteria can also help produce B vitamins, which are important for many functions in the body, including energy production, and vitamin K, which is important for things like blood clotting and bone health. They also produce something called short chain fatty acids, which we shall mention in a bit more detail later. On the other hand, harboring less diversity and more harmful bacteria can imbalance these activities, causing inflammation in the gut Amazon and more globally across the body, leading to disease. This imbalance in bacteria is termed gut dysbiosis. Now, it's important to note that the gut microbiome isn't just magically there and static in nature, but dynamic and is shaped by many things throughout the life of a human being. So let's now look at this. It used to be thought that the womb was a clean and sterile environment with no bacteria present. However, research is beginning to show us that it isn't necessarily the case, but more needs to be done to really understand the role of this exposure and any potential significance. But what we do know is that there is significant exposure to bacteria during birth. The birth canal also has a dynamic microbiome throughout pregnancy, and changes in the last parts of pregnancy allow for the canal's preparation for the baby. As the baby passes through the birth canal and swallows beneficial bacteria, thus begins the seeding of the gut microbiome. This is important as it starts the process of training the immune system of the gut, essentially teaching it what is friendly and what isn't, and thus being able to respond appropriately. But the question is, why do we have an immune system in the gut? Well, think of it like this, our mouth and hence our gut is in contact with the outside world, especially when we put something in our mouth. So the gut has to be ready for less friendly bugs and other things coming down. And amazingly, the gut contains 70 to 80% of the immune system of the body. The defense system of the gut also includes its lining. On the left side of this picture, which you will see with my cursor, the cells of this lining are pa packed tightly together by tight junctions. It acts as a barrier between the things traveling down the gut, which would be up above the cells here, where you see the cursor, and the bloodstream down over here. And it opens and closes to regulate the movement of molecules and water. It also contains a layer of mucus, which would be laying above the cells over here which allows beneficial bacteria to adhere to it and these bacteria then also contribute further to the gut barrier function. Just before I continue if I could just ask the one or two people who may uh, still be have their sound on if you could just mute please that would be much appreciated. Now however if the barrier is damaged as you can see on the right side of this picture and the tight junctions loosen the cells part and can't control what they let through and what stays out, leading to what is popularly known as leaky gut. This can allow bacteria, viruses and undigested food to leak through into the bloodstream, uh, activating the immune system and subsequently uh, inflammation in the gut and across the entire body. Additionally, bacterial toxins known as endotoxins can also leak through and have the same effect. A leaky gut has been associated with allergies and asthma, inflammatory bowel disease, 
obesity, diabetes, autism, and autoimmune conditions where our own immune system attacks our own body, such as celiac disease and rheumatoid arthritis. Other symptoms one may experience with a leaky gut can include abdominal pains and bloating, diarrhea, fatigue, memory issues, brain fog, muscle and joint aches, and rashes. Now, a natural delivery may not always be possible, and in certain circumstances, such as emergencies, a cesarean section may be necessary. In this situation, the birth canal is bypassed, and the baby is exposed to different kinds of bacteria of the skin and the hospital environment. This can disrupt the immune building process of the gut and predispose to health problems, uh, as exampled in the previous slide. Following birth, the next determinant of gut microbiome building is whether the infant is breastfed or not. Fascinatingly, breast milk contains beneficial bacteria which are sampled from the mother's gut and transferred into the breast milk and to the baby. It's also important to point out that bacteria are living organisms and so need food and fuel to survive and thrive as well. And this comes in the form of something called prebiotics. And it just so happens to be that breast milk actually provides these prebiotics, such as the amazing uh, capabilities uh, of nature. And we'll discuss a bit more about prebiotics uh, shortly. It's important to note that bottle feeding uh, won't provide these benefits of the uh, beneficial bacteria uh, and the prebiotics. Now, it's also important to appreciate and empathize with mothers who haven't been able to birth naturally or breastfeed, or maybe both. Uh, and although their children may not have the optimal beginning to their gut microbiome, there are many other factors throughout life that will determine the health and status of the gut. These can include food and nutrition, our other lifestyle factors, and intake of antibiotics. So let's start off by taking a little look at food and nutrition. So this is a study that looked at children from Burkina Faso in Africa and Italy, aged between about one and six. And what the researchers wanted to do was to analyze the diet and gut bacteria of each group. So they got poo samples from both sets of children, sent them for analysis and looked at what bacteria were present. And what they found uh, was that the children from Burkina Faso had more diversity and beneficial bacteria. And when looking at the dietary practices of each group, they found that the children from Burkina Faso had a higher fiber plant-based diet, as opposed to Italian diet, which was richer in animal fats and proteins and lower in fiber-rich foods. So maybe this seems to suggest that fiber-rich diets are associated with a healthier gut microbiome. And indeed, more and more research is being done showing the benefit that fiber can have on the gut microbiota and how lower fiber intake can negatively impact on gut health. So what could it be about fiber that seems to make it so important for gut health? Well, remember we mentioned those prebiotics just a short while ago. Bacteria are living and also need food to thrive and survive and use prebiotics to do this. And it just so happens to be that these prebiotics are fibers. Fibers are some things that we can't really digest and get down to our large bowel where the beneficial bacteria can use them for their food. And in return, by fermenting these fibers, they produce something called short chain fatty acids. And short chain fatty acids have been shown to help maintain a healthy, bowel lining and also to protect against inflammation in the gut itself, but also across the body. Now plants contain their own unique nutrients called phytonutrients and one category of phytonutrients are polyphenols. Polyphenols are found in lots of different plant foods such as fruits, vegetables, seeds, teas and cocoa. And they have properties such as being antioxidant, being anti-inflammatory antiviral, antibacterial, and even anti-cancer. And they've been shown to help increase the beneficial bacteria and short chain fatty acid production. Now, just like all nutrients, fat is required by the body 
but we don't need it in such high amounts. And in general, a healthy plant-based diet is lower in fats, and studies show that this and also the type of fats found in plant foods have a beneficial effect on the gut. However, saturated fats found predominantly in animal products like meat, eggs, and dairy tend to reduce beneficial bacteria and thus affect the health status of the gut. And a similar thing can be said about protein, with plant proteins in studies having been shown to increase beneficial bacteria and short-chain fatty acid production, but with animal proteins reducing beneficial bacteria and short-chain fatty acid production, thus increasing the risk of inflammation in the bowel and in the body and increasing the risk of things like bowel cancer. Other dietary factors such as alcohol, sweeteners and refined sugar and pesticides can all have a detrimental effect on the gut microbiome. And interestingly, studies are showing that sweeteners, which were produced to replace refined sugars, may have an effect on the gut microbiota, leading to insulin resistance, which I'll mention shortly, and weight gain. So let's have a look at a few examples of associations between gut health, inflammation, and disease. Now, Overweight and obesity is on the rise, and studies indicate that those who are overweight or obese tend to have less diverse and less beneficial microbiota, leading to a reduction in short-chain fatty acid production and an increase in energy extraction from the food. So this can lead to weight gain. Carrying extra weight is associated with insulin resistance. Insulin is a hormone produced by the body in order to help uh, control blood sugar levels. But in a state of insulin resistance caused by saturated fat building up in our cells, we struggle to control sugar levels, which can lead to diabetes. Insulin resistance will also contribute to high blood pressure and heart disease as a result of the inflammation it can cause in blood vessels. Being overweight and obese can also cause general inflammation in the body and can predispose to certain cancers as well. Now, another interesting uh, link between the gut microbiome is with heart disease and something called TMAO. Now, if you look at the top left corner of this picture, you can see red meat, which is high in an amino acid called carnitine. And amino acids are building blocks of protein. And just below that, you can see eggs, seafoods, and dairy, which is high in a nutrient called choline. Now, when you eat animal-based foods, this changes the kinds of bugs that are in our bowel. And these different bugs that we grow or nurture in our bowel are there to be able to process these foods. However, when you get animal-based carnitine and choline going into the gut, these bacteria convert it into something called TMA. This TMA then travels to the liver, and from the liver, it's converted into something called TMAO. And TMAO has been shown to increase the furring up of your blood vessels, thus increasing the narrowing of your blood vessels, which can increase the risk of heart attack, strokes, and even death. Now, carnitine is something that's not essential for us to consume. The body can actually make it, but it is also present in, in plant foods. However, choline is something that we do need to consume and is important for a number of uh, different actions uh, in the body. But it just so happens to be that choline is present in plant foods as well and is high in cruciferous vegetables such as Brussels sprouts and broccoli and also, and also in legumes, so beans and lentils. And what researchers wanted to see was whether plant-based choline also leads to a rise in TMAO or not. And what they found is that plant-based choline doesn't lead to a rise in TMAO levels, but in fact, the fiber and phytonutrients from these plant foods actually have a beneficial effect on the gut microbiome. Now, another interesting thing to look at is saturated fat and endotoxins, which we mentioned a little bit earlier. So saturated fat is found predominantly in animal products, uh, such as meat, eggs, and dairy. And animal products also tend to have a high bacterial load. And when you heat animal products, these bacteria can be damaged and killed. 
And when, they, and when this happens, they release endotoxins. These endotoxins survive the heat process and they also survive our corrosive stomach acid and digestive juices. The endotoxins are then absorbed into the bloodstream along with the saturated fat, which can lead to something called bacterial endotoxemia or inflammation in the blood vessels and body as a result of endotoxins. So let's have a look at some other lifestyle factors that can have an impact on our gut health. Now, the gut is home to lots of nerves, so many, in fact, that it's commonly called the second brain. It helps with a number of different functions, as mentioned earlier, but including effects on our mood, stress, and anxiety levels. Serotonin is one of the nerve molecules that has an important role to play in mood, and the gut bacteria produce a whopping 90% of it. Spanning from the brain and right down to the gut is the vagus nerve, which effectively acts as a communication channel between the gut and the brain. And this is also known as the microbiome gut-brain axis. And the vagus nerve itself is part of the parasympathetic nervous system, which when activated allows for rest, relaxation, regeneration, and good digestion. Now, in the past, when our ancestors were living closer to nature, they would have been faced by predatory animals. And that's certainly not a, t not a time when we want to be so relaxed, but we want to be on the go. The body goes into fight or flight adrenaline mode. And when in this mode, it shunts blood uh, and oxygen to parts of the body that really matter, such as the muscles, and away from parts of the body that aren't necessary for survival, such as the gut, immune, and reproductive systems. And in more prolonged cases of stress, the body will also produce more cortisol. And once out of danger, the body can then start to gradually relax again. However, in this day and age, we always seem to be chased by the saber tooth of work and life stress, which can have an impact on our sleep quality as well. And so we are always in a low grade fight or flight mode, leading to chronic cortisol production and reduced functioning of the gut and other systems. This can then lead to a reduction in stomach acid levels, which won't just affect digestion, but acid also acts as a defense mechanism, killing off harmful bugs coming down the gut. So with reduced stomach acid, this could increase the risk of unfriendly bugs taking hold of the gut environment. Chronic stress can also reduce an antibody in our gut called IgA, which is also involved in protecting the gut, and can also reduce the protective mucus that we mentioned earlier. Now, stress can also have a direct impact on the integrity of our gut lining. Now, let me go through this diagram with you. So we mentioned cortisol being a stress hormone at A, can contribute to a leaky gut at B, which can lead to endotoxins passing across the gut at C, setting off an immune system uh, reaction at D, and then into the rest of the body from the gut at E, including the brain and inflammation in the brain cells, which can contribute and lead to mental health problems such as depression and anxiety. Now exercise, movement, is an important aspect of our, of our health. And studies are also showing benefits that exercise can have on the gut microbiome too. However, elite sports and overexertion may negatively impact on gut health by reducing IgA levels, increasing cortisol, and potentially making the gut more leaky. Again, diet can have a key role to play in maintaining good bacteria with high fiber plant-based approaches encouraging beneficial bacteria, short chain fatty acid production and subsequent gut integrity. Now, antibiotics can be life-saving in cases of serious infection. However, over the years, we have seen a massive overuse of them, which can lead to issues such as antibiotic resistance. They can also affect the balance of beneficial bacteria, 
which have and which have uh, which we have and can lead to an overgrowth of less hospitable bacteria. And additionally, many antibiotics are given to livestock uh, in order to reduce the spread of infection, but also in some parts of the world to encourage growth and fat uh, content of the animals. So by consuming animal products, one may also be exposed to ant antibiotics in that way as well. Ah, doctor, what am I going to do? My diet isn't great and I'm stressed and I don't get to exercise like I want to. Is there any hope for my gut? Can I change things? Yes, you can. There is always a way that things can be improved. And it's always best to work with a naturopathic practitioner like myself, a naturopathic nutritional therapist who, can have, who has the appropriate knowledge and experience in helping, guiding, uh, and looking after you on this journey. So what can we do? Well, here's a general overview of what can be done to help heal the gut. There's something called the 5R protocol. Now, the first R is to remove the things that are damaging your gut and the gut microbiome. So this could be things like harmful foods, such as animal products, toxins such as alcohol and refined foods such as sugar, uh, uh, and also foods that may leak through a leaky gut. So for example, common examples would be things like dairy, wheat, and gluten that could go into the, through the leaky gut and cause inflammation. And it's also important to get rid uh, of unfriendly bacteria. And there are many natural remedies for this that can be used. The next thing is to replace the supportive systems in the gut. So things like bringing up your stomach acid levels and digestive juices as well. The next R is re-inoculating, which means bringing the good bacteria back into the gut, which can be done through probiotic supplements, but also through probiotic foods such as sauerkraut and kimchi. But it's also important to provide the prebiotics, the fiber that is going to help them to thrive in your gut. It's also important to think about repairing the gut lining. And there's many different nutrients that can be used uh, to repair the gut lining. So antioxidants such as vitamin C and E, magnesium, zinc, glutamine and quercetin, all of these are examples of things that can help with healing the lining of the gut. But perhaps the most important R is rebalance. How can we maintain gut health and bacterial balance in the long term? Maybe looking at the blue zones would give us a bit of an idea of, of this. So the blue zones are areas in the world with the longest and healthiest living populations. And you can see from this picture that they are scattered across the world. Now, if we take three of them, Loma Linda in California, Sardinia in Italy, and Okinawa in Japan, and we see where they all intersect, we can see that they have a very holistic and well-rounded approach to life. They have a sense of togetherness in family and society. They don't smoke. They're physically active. They all eat legumes, that's beans and lentils, and they all center around a plant-based diet. Now let's have a look at the Adventist group from Loma Linda. And they're interesting because they're actually the only group um, in uh, the blue zones who have a subpopulation who are 100% plant-based or, or vegan. So in this study, um, the researchers looked at the various dietary practices of Adventists. And Adventists are a religious group. And there were those who were non-vegetarian at the top, there were those that were semi-vegetarian who ate less animal products. Then there were the pescatarians, the lacto-over vegetarians, who are vegetarians that eat dairy and eggs. Uh, and then there were the vegans who are 100% plant-based and don't consume any animal products at all. And what they wanted to see was the rate of disease in, uh, in each of these groups. Now, this is what they found. So the first thing here is BMI. Now, BMI is a rough indicator of how healthy your weight is compared to your height. 
A healthy BMI is anywhere between 18, 19 to 25. Being overweight would be classed as a BMI of 25 to 30, and over 30 would be classed as being obese. And what you can see from these numbers, if you can see my cursor, is as you become more and more and more plant-based, the average BMI in each of these subgroups improves. I have noticed one thing. Remember how we said that a BMI of up to 25 is considered healthy. Despite the BMI going down, the more and more plant-based you become, it was only the vegans, the group that were 100% plant-based, that on average had a healthy BMI. Even the vegetarians on average had a slightly overweight BMI. And the same can, thing can be said with diabetes. And if you follow these numbers down, these decimal numbers, you can see that the rate of disease of diabetes is gradually reducing and reducing and reducing the more plant-based one becomes. And the same thing can be seen with high blood pressure, with the numbers reducing and reducing and reducing. So, a wonderful whole food, plant-based diet, organic, rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, and also rich in fiber and those all important phytonutrients will help to ensure a healthy gut and a healthy body, whilst being mindful about vitamins like B12 and D, which is generally the case for everyone anyway. And remember that picture I showed you earlier, where a whole food plant-based diet will also help uh, with our mental well-being by encouraging beneficial bacteria and increasing short-chain fatty acids. And so, helping maintain a healthy gut lining, which you see at A over here, protecting, uh, protecting against a leaky, leaky gut and the leakage of endotoxins and inflammation at B. And then there's the vagus nerve at C, which communicates with the gut to exert antidepressive and anti-anxiety effects. And point D refers to the use of probiotics, prebiotics, and fecal microbiome a microbiome transplantation, uh, uh, which can help with gut mental, uh, which can help with mental health. Now, I'll mention something about fecal microbiome, uh, microbial transplantation uh, in just a little bit. Very interesting area. Now, there's lots of studies that are also showing the effects that diet can have uh, on depression and anxiety, where this study showed that the consumption of more plants can help improve our mental health, and how restriction of animal products in this study also helps to improve our mental health. And this study, a GEICO study done in the work environment, had two, two groups of people two groups of employees, one who was given advice on following a plant-based diet and another one that wasn't. And when they followed them up after 18 weeks, they found that there was a significant improvement in mental health, in, in mood and anxiety in the group that was advised on the vegan diet. Now, it's also important to be aware of the effects of meditation and relaxation on our gut health as we saw through activation of the vagus nerve. And this study showed the importance of, med of meditation on maintaining a healthy gut barrier function and potentially also having uh, beneficial effects on the gut microbiome uh, as well. And one of the one of the exercises that I really like that can help activate your vagus nerve is something called Ujjayi Pranayam, which is a breathing exercise which you can easily YouTube. And some other simple uh, vagus nerve activating exercises uh, include humming, um, chanting Om, and also singing as well. So all of these things can really help with relaxation and improving digestive processes. And here's a few other things to consider uh, as well uh, to help with the buildup of the gut microbiome. Now, we should always encourage natural birthing where possible, but where it's not possible and a cesarean section is required, there is the option of something called vaginal seeding. 
And this is where a swab can be kept in the birth canal for maybe about an hour or so before the baby uh, is born via the C-section. And then once the baby is born, the baby can be rubbed down and wrapped up in that swab and so hopefully can receive some of the beneficial bacteria from the mum's birth canal. It's also important to encourage breastfeeding as much as possible, mindful to be uh, mindful of the intake of alcohol, refined foods and pesticide ridden foods as well. It's important to make sure we're doing healthy levels of exercise and only using antibiotics where entirely necessary. Now, fecal microbial transplant, bit of a bit of a mouthful, uh, but interesting topic. And uh, there have been studies on this. And uh, in fact, uh, guys in St. Thomas's uh, in, uh, in London are actually using uh, fecal microbial transplantation as a therapy um, against uh, a harmful overgrowth of a bacteria called C. difficile. And it, essentially, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's giving healthy bacteria from a healthy subject uh, and actually transplanting that into someone who may be unhealthy with an unbalanced microbiome uh, and potentially in the future other diseases such as obesity, um, gut inflammation and other inflammatory processes across the body. Um, and these, uh, this transplantation can be done um, by putting them up the backside. But interestingly, as this picture seems to show, they can also be given um, from the upper part of the gut. So you can actually take them through the mouth and swallow them. They will reach the gut uh, and will be able to exert, uh, uh, um, exert some kind of effect that way. Uh, but again, it's important to remember that although these good bacteria that will be transplanted, these probiotics that will be transplanted uh, will help the gut, to keep them there and to help these beneficial uh, bacteria to thrive in your gut, it's important to provide those fibers and prebiotics. And the way we can do that is with a whole food plant-based diet uh, and also with the other holistic things with our lifestyle, with relaxation uh, and exercise, uh, healthy exercise as, uh, as well. Now, if you're thinking about uh, a few things to help you on this road, um, this is a wonderful uh, website, um, plantpacedcookingshow.com, uh, which has wonderful whole food plant-based recipes with no refined products such as sugars or oils, and of course, no animal products. And you can make all your favorites. And I'm sure you're looking at the pictures of these wonderful desserts at the moment. And yes, they are, they are delicious and completely possible on a whole food plant-based diet. If you like your Indian foods, there's another wonderful organization called Sharon, who provide wonderful whole food plant-based recipes uh, for cooking Indian foods, Indian snacks, Indian desserts, and also other global dishes as well. And then there's also Dr. Greger. You may or may not know of Dr. Greger, but he has a wonderful website called nutritionfacts.org. And he's brought out a wonderful free app called Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen. And in this, he basically lines out the things that we should be getting into our diet every day. And you can see on the right side and the left side, you can see the kinds of things that he advises. And the great thing about the app is, and you can see in the picture on the right, is it's almost like a, a checkbox. So you can have a look at beans and berries and other fruits up here, and it gives you check boxes on the portions you need to have. And if you're not sure about a portion size or what something may be in a particular group, like if you're not sure what cruciferous vegetables are, you just click on the I and it gives you examples of what foods are in that category. And also it gives you um, portion sizes as well, which is fabulous. And additionally, he also, the, uh, uh, the app also links into videos that he has on his website, nutritionfacts.org, so you can find out more about the benefits uh, of these foods. So a really, really good free app that I would really suggest uh, downloading, which can really help you on your journey to uh, optimizing uh, and making sure that you're getting um, everything good you need into your diet and lifestyle. So we've had a whistle-stop tour of the gut microbiome and gut health. And I'm sure we can appreciate the importance of various different factors in our lifestyle, stemming from birth to development in infancy and childhood, our diet, and also our lifestyle factors. 
and the effect of that all of these can have um, on our gut health and general health as well. And we can see that a whole food plant-based diet and a holistic approach to life is what can help you to great health in your gut Amazon and the body as a whole. And connecting it back to what I mentioned right at the beginning, through our connection to nature and the plant world and choosing not to contribute to animal agriculture, we can also help ensure a better future for the Amazon rainforest and our home and that of our children, Earth. Now, WFPB.org is an organization that lives and breeds this message. The founder and a wonderful friend of mine, Margarita Restrepo, who has founded WFPB.org, has put this wonderful description together of the organization. WFPB.org is an independent, non-partisan, non-profit organization that empowers sustainable health for humans and planet through a plant-based lifestyle. It connects human health, prevention and reversal of chronic human disease, and planetary health, prevention and reversal of planetary destruction, as two codependent factors. It also supports and demonstrates that a plant-based structure can have multiple health, environmental, and economic benefits towards a sustainably healthier humanity and planet across the globe. Now, there's a wonderful website. It's wfpb.org. Uh, please feel free to go and visit it, uh, sign up for, for the newsletters, and feel free to download the amazing universal guideline that uh, uh, Margarita has put together. Uh, she's put together part one, and I believe part two is is in, in the process uh, of, of being put together. Um, and uh, we're also actively recruiting volunteers uh, across the world uh, for wfpb.org and to take this message forward in our respective uh, communities. Um, and um, in the UK, um, we also have a team um, that's growing, uh, a vibrant team uh, with, uh, you know, lots of different people with lots of diff uh, different energies and uh, ideas. Um, so if you are interested uh, in joining um, the WFPB.org volunteering team, um, please get in contact with us. Um, our, our, our emails are at the bottom of this slide, margarita at WFPB.org or myself mesh at wfpb.org. And uh, Margarita has also produced a wonderful uh, magazine called The Naked Food Magazine, which provides great information um, on uh, with, with recipes, uh, nutritional science, and uh, the uh, impacts um, of our actions on, on the planet uh, and the benefits of uh, a plant-based lifestyle for our planet as well, um, with articles written from uh, esteemed uh, people um, across the field um, uh, of medicine and science and, uh, and, and other fields as well. Now, just a brief mention um, of um, the service I provide. Um, as I mentioned, my, my passion is natural healing through a whole food, plant-based, uh, holistic lifestyle. Um, and with, uh, with my service, uh, nutritional therapy service, um, I like to provide people uh, with another chance in life to be able to get down to the root cause uh, of problems and giving people the chance to experience good health and happiness uh, again. Um, so if you've been affected or you know anybody who may be affected by anything that's been shared in this presentation, or if you have any other health conditions or you want to improve or enhance your uh, nutrition, diet, lifestyle, then please get in touch with me. Um, I've got a website that's just recently gone live, so it still needs a lot of editing and adding and improvement. Um, but please uh, do visit uh, me at uh, thegreendoctor.uk. Uh, um, alternatively, uh, you can email me at mahesh at thegreendoctor.uk. And there's my telephone number down there as well there as well. So um, please feel free to, to make a note of all this and get in touch and I'll be more than happy to, to chat and, uh, and help you uh, as necessary. I'm also on social media, um, uh, so you can um, grab me on Facebook, uh, my personal Facebook at Mahesh Mesh Shah, um, and I've also got a page uh, called The Green Doctor LTD, um, and also I'm on Instagram, uh, which is underscore The Green Doctor underscore, uh, and I'm also at, on, on LinkedIn as well, so you can find me uh, that way as well. Um, 
that's it for my presentation. I know it's been a whistle-stop tour of the gut microbiome and gut health. I hope it's been helpful. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, if there are lots of questions and we don't have a chance, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards individually, um, either directly or by email. So um, don't worry if you can't um, get your question to me uh, right now as well, but we'll do the best we can. Um, I'll stop sharing and I'll hand over to Brian again. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. <laughs> um, yeah, very, very comprehensive. A lot of information there. I said it will be available for those who want to watch it again um, afterwards. We'll be putting it up onto, onto YouTube. Um, we have a few questions that have come through on mm -hmm. in the chat box. Um, the first one, can previous antibiotic mm -hmm. use be rectified or is the harm permanent? Sure. So uh, with uh, with antibiotics, um, absolutely, they they may be necessary, as we've said. But when they do when they do get rid of the potentially harmful bacteria that may be causing the infection, um, they do also get rid of uh, a lot of beneficial bacteria uh, in the in the gut as well. And that's an important point um, uh, to make uh, as well. Important point to bring up. Um, now. The good thing is, is that no, they don't permanently have to uh, alter the gut microbiome. There are things we can do. Uh, one of the things that I would suggest is um, you can take a probiotic alongside antibiotics. And now there are specific antibi um, probiotics that, are, that can be taken um, with antibiotics that aren't affected by antibiotics. Uh, but also taking a, a good quality probiotic after antibiotics just to build up uh, the bacteria again uh, is a good idea. And obviously making sure that we're eating those whole plant fiber rich foods uh, to help them survive and thrive uh, in the gut. Um, so absolutely, um, antibiotics do have an effect on the gut but there's always something um, that we can do um, to help improve and, and rebalance um, the gut microbiome again. Uh, thank you. The other one was, are there, and this is about natural prebiotic containing foods mm. that you may be recommending. Because prebiotics is about helping the digestion, isn't it, rather than Sure. Floor, right? Sure. So, so prebiotics. So, fibers. Fibers generally come um, in in two forms. There's there's soluble fibers and there's insoluble fibers. Um, insoluble fibers are the ones that kind of get down to the gut and help with movement of of our bowel motions. Uh, the soluble fibers are the ones um, that almost turn into kind of like a gel in your in your large bowel. And this is this is the kind of fiber that the that the bacteria are then able to ferment uh, and process and able to use uh, uh, as as a fuel and produce those all important short chain uh, fatty acids uh, as well as other important chemicals. And these prebiotics are, are, are available anywhere, anywhere in, in, in the whole uh, in the whole food plant based uh, whole whole plant food kingdom, uh, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds. Um, so you can find them absolutely anywhere. Um, some good sources, uh, just examples: bananas and uh, apples and onions and chicory. And these are some of the uh, some of the examples. But you can't go wrong with uh, whole plant foods. Any whole plant foods are going to be uh, amazing uh, for prebiotics. Uh, you can also get prebiotics in, in supplemental form as well. And there are some probiotic supplements that have um, prebiotics with them. And in certain circumstances, this, this may be necessary for, for the short to medium term um, when helping someone um, healing uh, a leaky gut and uh, bringing the gut microbiome back into balance, which is something that I have done um, with, uh, with clients uh, that have come to me um, in my nutritional therapy practice. Um, but again, the important thing to remember is, is, is the long-term thing, is the rebalancing. What are we going to do in the long-term to help maintain uh, a healthy gut um, and, and microbiome? Um, a question which I think may, you may have answered, which is um, when can you take begin taking probiotics after antibiotics? But I think you said you can take them at the same time. <laughs> Sure. Right? So there are, yeah, that's right. So there are some antibiotics, uh, sorry, some probiotics um, that uh, that can survive alongside antibiotics. Um, so it may be a good idea to to start with those. Um, but then afterwards, um, I always tend to sort of advise that it's always good to top up um, with um, probiotics afterwards. And probiotics that contain a, a considerable amount uh, of uh, of bacteria as well. Um, by considerable amount, um, we uh, I, I mean sort of maybe 
sort of 20 billion, 50 billion, uh, that sort of uh, range uh, of, uh, of um, sort of bacteria uh, in, um, in a probiotic capsule. Uh, you, can get, you can get smaller ones, smaller ones with a couple of billion, uh, but really you probably want to be going for something, uh, something higher. Um, and also the quality of the probiotic uh, is important as well. So it's always important to make sure you're getting um, probiotics and you know, other supplements from um, good quality um, uh, supplement uh, companies as well. Thank you. Uh, no next question is, um, what effect does doing an occasional water-only fasting have on your gut? Some sure. People, I mean, you might want to extend that also because some people will be doing uh, juice fasting as well. I'd be interested to know for both of those. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So there is um, there is some research uh, to show that prolonged fasting um, or sort of water fasting uh, can sometimes uh, lead to a slight leakiness um, uh, in the gut lining. But there is also a lot of uh, a lot of research showing um, that fasting and things like intermittent fasting uh, have um, have a really beneficial effect uh, on the gut microbiome uh, and the gut health. Uh, overall. Um, so I think overall speaking, um, fasting um, is an important thing. Maybe people won't be able to, everybody might not be able to do water fasting or prolonged fasting. So certainly I would advise things like intermittent fasting. So for example, at least 12 hours of fasting overnight, because that gives a chance for your microbiome to rest, your microbiome to work and be active at the correct time of the day uh, as well. Um, so certainly fasting does, does have its benefits. Uh, I would say that it should always ideally be done um, with uh, having, having the knowledge and know-how of having uh, of knowing how to do it, um, but also uh, maybe having a, a practitioner who uh, is also uh, well-versed in uh, fasting so that you have someone there um, who can help uh, and provide uh, guidance on it. So certainly overall, I would say that fasting uh, does, have a, does have a benefit uh, on, on gut health and the, and the gut microbiome. Right, uh, and, and both for the water fast and the juice fast, yeah, generally speaking, generally speaking, I would say that's that's correct. And the the other important thing I would also say um, uh, about about fasting is um, just kind of a slight tangent, but there is uh, something that um, uh, a professor Walter Longo has shown through decades of his uh, research, uh, which is something called a fasting mimicking diet, where you consume extremely low calorie um, uh, diet for about five days uh, a month, so five days in a row. Um, which uh, and this would be a low uh, sort of a low carbohydrate plant based diet, um, which would put your body into a state of uh, ketosis or ketogenesis, uh, which in the short term over a five day period, for example, um, has been shown to have really beneficial uh, effects um, um, in our health uh, by getting rid of old and what we call senescent cells and activating the production of stem cells to repair and uh, regenerate the body. Um, so indeed, I would say that, uh, you know, a supervised uh, uh, a fast, whether it's a water fast or, or juice, fa juice fast uh, uh, is uh, can be beneficial um, and then obviously having the know-how of, of, of doing it and then how to gradually then build up uh, again uh, to a more solid diet afterwards uh, is also important as well. Okay thank you for that. Um, I no um, one of the participants Edomi has got a hand up I don't know if you want to uh, say something please. Yes I do. Um, I wanted Hi. to ask, I, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Hi. Yes, I wanted to ask um, whether like soya and tempeh are mm -hmm. beneficial um, and also are they also an, um, probiotic? Okay, so soya and tempeh, um, soya generally uh, has so many, so many, so many health benefits. Uh, I know um, depending on what we read and, and where we look, uh, there can be a lot of differing information uh, on how soya products um, 
can, may increase the risk of hormonal problems uh, such as breast cancer and other hormonal based uh, cancers. Uh, but in fact, um, if you look at the research and you look at the populations in the world where uh, there is natural soya consumption, um, you actually see that these populations actually have uh, a lower rate of, of hormonal cancers. So in the Far East, um, people who actually consume uh, soya products um, from adolescents actually have an overall uh, protection uh, against um, things like breast cancer. And people who, um, who may have uh, developed breast cancer and who subsequently start uh, consuming uh, soya uh, may actually have a reduced recurrence um, of, um, uh, of breast cancer. Um, soya is also so important for many uh, other reasons. So they contain these things called phytoestrogens, which is what makes people worry that, oh gosh, they've got estrogens and they may cause uh, breast cancer or other hormonal problems. But these phytoestrogens um, are, are not really like human estrogen and they actually activate the protective uh, effects that estrogen has uh, on the body. So as well as uh, being able to protect against uh, hormonal issues, uh, breast cancers, uh, it can also help with improvement of um, your heart health uh, uh, and bone health uh, and also um, uh, sort of uh, menopausal symptoms as well. So obviously at the menopause, our estrogen levels do, do reduce um, and this can increase the risk of uh, brittle bones, osteoporosis, uh, heart heart health, uh, so heart disease and all those things. Uh, phytoestrogens have been shown to, to help with those. Um, there are some, some studies that show that um, vast intakes of, uh, of uh, soya products, so we're talking uh, like maybe a few liters of soya milk a day or um, you know, five or more servings of soya a day may start to then have some of the less beneficial uh, effects um, that estrogen could have on the body. But really that's consuming a lot of soya um, uh, in one day. Um, the other thing to note about soya is soya-based um, protein powders. Um, where the protein from the soya is isolated, um, and this isolated protein, uh, which is the same with animal-based um, protein powders, um, has been shown to increase the levels of something called IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1, um, which can actually then increase the risk um, of, uh, of cancers uh, such as bowel cancer, prostate cancer, um, breast cancer. Uh, and the other important thing to also be aware of with soya is making sure that it is organic. Uh, as well, and ideally as least processed uh, as possible. So make sure that your soya products uh, are organic, um, non-GMO. Um, so I would say overall, soya is great, enjoy soya, um, uh, and uh, don't worry too much uh, about the, about the neg negative benefits of it. Um, just be aware of uh, making sure that it is organic, non-GMO, and that you're not gonna be drinking three liters of soya milk a day, basically. I hope that's I hope that's helpful. Yeah, sorry, a lot of information. Very helpful. Thank you. But soya <laughs> milk is um soya milk is that or is that a natural form or is that would you say that's a synthetic form? Sure. So I mean, at the end of the day, anything that um anything that is processed from the natural whole food is 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 not going to be in the whole form, right? It's going to be processed. So soya milk in itself is processed. Um, but then again, there are different kinds of soy milk. So you find the normal kinds of soy milk. So you find the regular soy milks that Alpro, for example, makes. Um, but then they also make an organic uh, soy milk uh, as well. So ideally, although you want to be uh, consuming things like, you know, uh, whole soya beans, ed edamame beans, those kinds of things, um, soya milk itself uh, is fine as is fine as well. Um, and a glass of soya milk a day uh, is not going to have a detrimental effect. Um, uh, it may actually have uh, help with some of the beneficial effects uh, that we that we mentioned. And also, sorry, just one more question: Is mm -hmm. it does it kind of matter? Like, is it essential to eat? to stop eating at a certain part of the day, like sure. um, for it to have a beneficial effect on the gut health. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's increasing research showing us that um, timing of eating uh, is so, so important. So that's kind of the concept of uh, intermittent fasting. Um, so generally, what I would say to people is if you can, maybe have your last meal by about 7 max 8 p.m. Um, and try to have an eight uh, sorry a 12 hour window overnight uh, which is uh, food free basically food and drink free um, so 
that's sort of around the time um, that you would that you would say, okay, maybe maybe it's you know it's a good idea to um, stop eating, give your gut a break overnight. And we more and more research, interestingly, is showing um, that um, the kinds of bacteria that are active during the daytime uh, and nighttime are different as well. So eating. Uh, eating at the right time is important and this can particularly be a problem for those people um, who are doing night shifts and, and general shift work that can be a bit tricky um, but in those cases where it's unavoidable it's all the more important to make sure that you are um, you know eating a healthy diet um, and your lifestyle otherwise um, is as healthy um, as it can be yes and also sorry That's one more question you said Sorry, uh, I don't need just that. I want to allow other people to ask some just, questions. That's just okay. to say, just to say, if you know, if anybody has you know questions or you know uh, lead on questions from anything else, don't worry if you can't ask them now. Um, I'm sure, hopefully, you've made a note of the ways you can contact me. By um, please feel to, feel free to contact me. I'm more than happy to more than happy to help. And, and just can ask if there's anybody that does have questions. If you could, uh, I would rather questions that relate to the gut. I've got some questions that may not be particularly gut related, um, but if they are, if you want to unmute yourself and ask, in, in, well, in the meantime, I've got one question that was on the Facebook group, which mm -hmm. says, what can be the cause of dysbiosis if an indiv individual has already been on a whole food vegan diet for a while? And I did have to have, actually had to have a look up to see what dysbiosis was, but I don't think you might <laughs> explain. Sure. So I very, I, sorry, there's so much content in this presentation. I very briefly described uh, what dysbiosis is. And dysbiosis is basically when you have an imbalance um, in, the, in the gut bacteria. So where you may not have enough of the, of the healthy bacteria. And maybe where some of the more unfriendly bacteria are starting to, or have taken a hold uh, of the gut, uh, leading to inflammation uh, in the gut and, and elsewhere in the body. Um, now, a whole food plant-based diet uh, is wonderful. Uh, it's absolutely amazing, and I can vouch for it for myself uh, personally as well. The wonders I've uh, I've experienced on, on a whole food plant based diet. Um, now, whole food plant a whole food plant based diet is is one pillar in lifestyle. The other pillars being, you know, exercise, sleep, stress levels, perspective, all those kinds of things, uh, connection to nature. So, whole food plant based diet is an important pillar, but it is one pillar. Of these group of pillars. So even if you are consuming a whole food plant-based diet, if you are super stressed, like we said, if you're in that fight or flight mode, um, you may not be producing enough stomach acid, you may not be producing enough digestive juices. So this could then lead to um, an increase in some of the um, less friendly and more harmful bacteria uh, taking residence uh, in, in parts of the gut. Um, so that's really something um, to think about uh, as well. Um, so there are there are these little things that we do need to think about. Whole food plant based diet in general uh, is going to sort out many of these issues, many many of these issues. But it's also important to look at um, uh, you know a holistic overall approach. Uh, and, and this is what I like to do um, with my uh, with my clients um, uh, through through uh, naturopathic uh, nutritional therapy. Um, and again, you know, if, if these are if these are issues or problems uh, for anybody, um, you know, I'd be more than happy um, uh, to to provide my services uh, to see what we can do to to bring you back to good health, uh, to, to to happiness, um, and to your sprightly self, if that's what uh, needs to be needs to be done. Uh, absolutely. Um, I hope I hope that's sort of helpful. I did I did say a little bit uh, about that in the in the presentation, but I, I appreciate there was a lot of information shared. <laughs> Thanks ever so much, Mesh. I'll just say there's some questions. Uh, if people have them on the, on the Facebook group, um, if they ask them there, hopefully that at some point you may be able just to pop in and give a quick answer to them, if that's okay with you. Or, or they can contact you direct um, via your website. Uh, there's a, is there an email link on the website? Uh, yes. Uh, so, so you can go to the website. You can use the contact form. Um, uh, so that's... Yeah, that's absolutely uk. The green yes, the, dot UK. That's right. The green doctor dot UK. Um, my email address is Mahesh. That's M A H E S H at the green doctor dot UK. Thanks ever so much again. Could I ask if people wouldn't mind just unmuting themselves and we can have a, a round of applause for Mesh. 
um, I'm going to say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, just say, uh, let me just cancel. Uh, just bear with me a moment. Uh,